Good morning, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. We are delighted to have you with us this morning on another Pastor's Corner. And many of you are already there. We really appreciate your presence. And we, we know you. We are happy to be with you as you are happy to be with us. This morning we have um, two of our wonderful, very knowledgeable guests. <laughs> um, with us this morning to, to deal with this very important subject. We, we're looking at the subject this morning, the topic, facing the last days with confidence. Facing the last days with confidence. We'll find out um, about the last days and how to face the last days with confidence. So, um, to my extreme right, we have um, Pastor Jamie Gordon. My, my extreme left, sorry, <laughs> Pastor Jamie Gordon. Um, Pastor Gordon. Um, He's one for young, brilliant pastors. Um, <laughs> um, he's the associate youth director for a conference. Um, he's also, of course, pastoring um, two or four churches over at um, Bylands and and Monlong. We and to my immediate left is um, a young, brilliant professor in making. I would say, Pastor Samora Bess. Um, Pastor Bess is. One of our intern pastors um, over there in the Eastern Two District. Uh, he works with, with, with me, along with, with me in four or four churches. And we're happy to have both Pastor Gordon and Pastor Bez this morning. Good morning, Pastor Gordon. Pleasant morning, Pastor Isaac. It's good to have you. Blessing to be here as well. Praise the Lord. Pastor Bez, what are you saying to the people? Good morning to everyone. It's a privilege to be here. All right. And I must say you look sharp in that suit. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer as we get ready to, to uh, roll on this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here in another pastor's corner. We thank you for our two guests, Pastor Gordon and Pastor Bess. We thank you for all our viewers and listeners. And as we delve, about to delve in yet another important, intriguing um, topic, I pray, Lord, that you'll illuminate our minds and our understanding that we'll be able to grasp what you need us to get this morning. Thank you, Father, for hearing and answering this prayer. We ask with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. So we say good morning to Sister Veronica, already there, and Brother Rolf Ferguson. Um, yes, thank you so much. Sister Ambrose, um, Sister Stephanie, um, Sister Hamilton, and Sister Magdalene, Claudette, Sister Stedlin, and you know, all of Sister Lucy. Hi, Sister Lucy, how is baby doing? We hope she's doing fine. We say all wonderful morning to all of you as we get ready. Facing the last days with confidence, Pastor Gordon. Question number one Do you think we are living in the last days? Very important question. Do you think we are living in the last days? Um, and part B to that question. Please share some biblical insight on the passage of First John two eighteen. Um, First John two eighteen. You know what is this passage of scripture? What what is this text saying? As we seek to answer the question, do you think we are living in the <clears throat> in the last days? Pastor God, you 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 begin by just responding to the question before we go to the 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 text. Do you think we live in the last days? I would say categorically, yes, we are. You live in the last days. Well, you need to tell our viewers, uh, maybe I should re then read the text and, and then maybe tell our viewers why you're saying we are living in the last days. You know, um, 1 John 2, 18 says, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. So your response to do you think we're living in the last days was an emphatic yes. Now, please, please help us to, explain, to understand that. Okay. Well, I think um, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18 does a good job of answering the question and also qualifying the answer. Um, so it starts by saying that we are living in the last time um, or the last dispensation or you can substitute it with living in the last days. He also goes forward to mention that the Antichrist will come. So, in other words, he speaks futuristically. But right after the comma, he then says, then many Antichrists have come. 
Mm-hmm. So in other words, um, when we marry that with Matthew chapter 24, um, when Jesus was giving the disciples some of the signs of the last days, um, he spoke about many false prophets shall impersonate Christ. And antichrist, you know, the word anti means obviously against. Persons who impersonate, persons who go against, persons who really contradicts what Jesus is all about. And when we look in our world today, we have seen that there have been many false prophets. Um, just recently to mention in Jamaica, um, the false prophet pastor um, who led sacrifices in taking the lives of members. And there are many throughout the world um, that preach a false gospel. So just the presence of these false prophets and other antichrists definitely, you know, give credence to the fact that indeed we are living in the last days. Okay. Pa- Pastor Bess. Well, I, I also agree with... Um Pastor Gordon, in that I also would say that we are indeed living in the last days. Um, as it pertains to the text, it clearly states, um, yes, that we are in the last days and identifies one of the signs that um, we can use to categorize, to see whether we are living rather in the last days. And it speaks of that of Antichrist. As was said earlier, I'm anti I'm Christ. Um, it, it means against Christ, you know. And so what we can see from the text here is that um the last days is 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 categorized by movements persons or people that would come against or or teach things contrary to what Jesus Christ um would have taught according to his words and um if we look around clef- carefully we would see that there are many movements many um things happening in our world that goes against the teaching of Christ. Um, Pastor mentioned earlier um, that of the, the, the false prophet in Jamaica who would have led sacrifices and so And there are many other things um, which goes against um, the proper day of worship, right, that Jesus would have already established in his word. Um, we can see uh, many religious denominations and so forth. They, they, they go against um, what Christ would have taught as the proper day of worship, as we know, that of being the, the Sabbath. And, and, and many other things, you know, um, what you eat, things like, you know, some persons tell you you could eat pig, you could eat all kind of things. You know, all of these teachings are things that goes against what Jesus Christ would have established in his words. And so we can clearly see that um, when you go against God, you are actually antichrist. And so, Pastor, I can also agree that we are living in the last days based on the text that you would have, um, have read. Okay, so we... We are agreeing, or guests are agreeing that we are indeed living the last days. Chris, Chris Ma is saying from the day we were born, we are living in the last days. Maybe, maybe so. But well, as we go through mm-hmm. the rest of the morning's um, program, we'll have to figure out, um, based on the, the, the topic, how do we then live in the last days and face the last days with confidence? And Pastor, I also you know? want to add one thing. Um, when we look at the text also, um, the emphasis, really, part of the emphasis of the text is that of helping us to understand also that any day could be our last as well. Yes. And um, we need to live every day with a spiritual mindset that any time could be indeed our last. And so we live it as if it, was, as if it is our last so that we would try our very best to live according to the words um, that, that, that is written in the word of God and to make sure that when the way we govern or the way we live is in harmony with what Jesus expects of us. And that is one, also one of the intentions of the age um, 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 apostle, John. He was trying to get the believers to understand the spiritual importance of that message in um, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. Wonderful, wonderful. So we're moving on. We, I think I will agree with you both that we are indeed living in the last days. There is no, there is no doubt about that. So we move on to question number two. According to 2 Timothy, which I'll read shortly, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5, the Apostle Paul describes human behavior in the last days. Yes? How can the Christian successfully navigate this period without losing his or her hold on Christ? That is 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, uh, right on to verse 5. So uh, let me just um, read this passage for us. It says, but Mark this from the NIV. Reading from the NFA, he says, There shall be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, 
disobedient to the parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of God, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And verse 5 says, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. The Apostle Paul describes it, the condition of the last days. Knowing that, first the best, how can a Christian successfully navigate the Christian experience with these conditions which the Apostle Paul mentioned? Well, Pastor, that's a very good question. And I would venture to say, um, when we look at first, Second Timothy rather, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, it states uh, some characteristic traits that um, would be highlighted or would be seen prevalently in the last days as it pertains to man and their relationship with each other and also their relationship with God. Um, we see here in the text, for example, it, it, it points out a few things. You know, lovers of their own selves. When you, when you think about that, the Christian is called to be selfless, right? Um, of course, you, you love yourself, but you don't do anything to, 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 to your own benefit and by the means of trampling or bringing down others. In other, in other words, as a Christian, you would try your best to live to please God. You would live to be a blessing uh, towards your fellow men. Um, there are also some other things. Um, it calls like things like traitors. The, it highlights people would be traitors. Um, you want to make sure that you live true and honest and you are genuine in the way you interact and, and the way you conduct business with, with people. Um, it also mentioned um, um, that of having a form of godliness. And to me, that is one of the, the big points in the text because uh, many persons go around saying, well, I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord. And when you look at um, the way they live, According to the word of God, you realize that their lifestyle is totally contrary to what God expects of us in his word. And so it calls for one to be very genuine, very um, authentic with the Christian experience uh, with Jesus. I think if we, if we follow some these guidelines, um, we should be on our path towards um, navigating through this difficult period in our history. Okay, um, wonderful. Pastor, Pastor God, you, you need to add something to this, I believe, and, and, and maybe... It, you know, a form of godliness, Pastor God. Um, so I would agree that um, since the entrance of sin, especially that we have witnessed and we have seen, you know, all of these carnal, selfish attributes from human beings, you know, dating from Adam and Eve, going right down to the, the, the son Cain, and down through the ages, we, we have seen this. And I believe that especially in these times, they have intensified. Um, now, how do we navigate without losing our hold on God, without just having a form of godliness, um, just an appearance, without having the substance to back it up? Um, I would just give some, some little pointers, I believe, that will be able to help us. And I would say, number one, these passages give us some nice clues, um, or they, they help us to put a nice estimate on the true nature of human beings. So, in other words, human beings, we see that we are selfish, and notice, notice I'm saying, not them, but we. <laughs> we are selfish. We are unstable. We are, we are anti-Christ by nature, right? right? So without intervention, we are lost. We are doomed. We are corrupt. We are rotten from the core. So I believe that human beings, you know, Christians seeking salvation, seeking to be saved, we should put the right estimate on human beings. So in other words, we are not God. We should not venerate persons so that when a human being makes a mistake, we are swayed by their wrongdoing. And I would also say when we have a proper estimate of who human beings are, we are then able to put a proper estimate on who God is because God contrasts human beings. And while we are unstable, while we are corrupt, God is pure, God is honest, God is true. He has the standard. And I believe that as we put our compass or you know our foundation in God, he would help us to stand. Um, also, we should understand the nuances of the great controversy, the daily battle between good and evil. And many of these attributes are not just descriptions, but it's a war from the inside out. When we are selfish, it's when we put self over God. Um, when we are violent, it's when we put our carnal desires, our hatred, or resentment over the will of God. 
Um, so by understanding the great controversy, what role we play and how it affects us, and at the end of the great controversy, we know that anything sin like will be destroyed. And I would say finally, we should connect with God daily as we make right choices. So we should choose not to have a form, but we should be we should be filled with the Spirit of God. We should choose not to be a traitor, but to be a genuine disciple of God. And we have many disciples, we have many examples, sorry, in the Bible of you know disciples and persons who walked with Christ, but they exhibited many of these traits. So I would say the last point to me is one of the most important. Stay connected. Reject the wrong and always choose what is right. Okay. Um, you know, quite profound. Um, so I think both of you are saying the Apostle Paul has indicated what will be. Yes. Or we would say what, what is. But that doesn't mean that we have to be, um, as you would say, a statistic in, in, that, in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, we can nonetheless navigate and live successful Christian lives um, irrespective of what all that is the negativity that is happening around us. So, so there are traitors, but we don't have to be traitors. We can be true and honest. Lots of um, um, the, the, the word of God talk about traitors, conceited, uh, as, you, as you said, um, proud, but we can, we can choose to be humble with Jesus. So I, I would add, and I agree with both of you, that staying connected with Jesus can make all the difference. Yes, staying connected to, with Jesus can make all the difference. Pastor, can I just add one more thought? As sure, it sure, Pastor. To it? Um, when we look at um, Galatians chapter 5, um, you would realize that there is a compare and contrast happening there in relation to those who are led by the Spirit of God and those who are led by the flesh. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at those who are led by the flesh, you would see many of the things that is listed in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. You would see there in um, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 uh, to 21, right? But then it tells you of the way the man who is led by the Spirit um, um, conducts himself. He would be love. He would experience joy, peace, you know, long-suffering, gentleness. He would be honest, goodness, faith, and so on. And so it tells you that um, God, ex God wants us to live different in these last days, but the only way we can do it, as both of you rightfully highlighted, is by staying connected to God and allowing His Holy Spirit to lead us and develop within us the fruit of the Spirit. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, and um, Ferguson is saying the Holy Spirit will help us as, um, you know, to be overcomers. Yes, and, and that, is, that is so true. The Holy Spirit, because we can't do it on our own. Yes, um, was Heinz? It's saying knowing the Lord and knowing of the Lord are two different things. Of course, naturally so. You can know of him. You can hear someone talk of him. But to know him is a personal, intimate knowledge yes. of, of God yourself. And therefore, you, you know, you can make the difference there. Thank you so much for that comment. Keep sending your comments to us. And if there's any questions, of course, I, I told you we have um, two young professors here in the making. And they will be surely... Be able to answer your questions. Uh, we, we go on to um, question number three. Can you please clarify, pastors, um, 1 Timothy 4.1, a passage which I'll read, 1 Timothy 4.1, and then the, question, the part B of that question is how can we be certain we are listening to the correct spirit? How can we be certain? Lots of spirit out there. Spirits out there. How can we be certain that we are listening to the correct spirit? So um, 1 Timothy 4 one says, the Spirit clearly says, um, the King James who says, speak it, the Spirit speak it expressly. The New King James says, the, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Pastor Gordon, the Spirit clearly says, help us to understand this passage, that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith. What does that mean? You'll have to help us un understand. What does abandon the faith mean? And follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Well, I think the, the passage is very self-explanatory. Um, let me just try my best to expound on it a bit. Um, now, one, in verse one, 
the, the passage or the inspired words definitely comes from the Spirit of God. It says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Um, so while there are many different spirits in the world, the Spirit of God is very expressive, um, speaks loudly, speaks very clearly. Um, it is not hard to miss. And it goes on to say that in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith. So it is not a maybe, but it has happened, it is happening, and it will continue to happen. And just a quick example, Saul, King Saul, Saul left communication with God, and he actually went to uh, what, what we would say in our local parlance, and, and Obi a walker. <laughs> so in other words, he, he gave up on the spirit of God. But, but Pastor, hold a minute. You're, yeah. re you're referring to King Saul, not so? King Saul. King Saul, who was king of Israel. That's the man. So you're saying while he was king. Yes, man. He, de he departed. He departed. So, um, am I to conclude that persons can still be attending church and, and yet have departed? Is that what you're saying? Of course. Of course. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and another example is like, Eli, when they, when they cried out, Ichabod, the glory of God, had departed. <laughs> and Miss White even commented, um, while um, after they crucified Christ, um, a lot of the services were going on in the temple as normal. But the spirit was not present. And also, Pastor, um, that is what the text prior said, having a form, mm -hmm. a form of godliness, right? It means you, you can't look in like, like, you know, you're there, but you, really and truly, you're not there. You just have a form. So it's clear that you can be in the faith or in church, rather, and not really connected to the vine, which is Jesus Christ. Yes. Okay. Now, now, I, you know, I just want to delay still on this, this, this passage. Um, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. Yeah, yeah. How can we know that the spirit is deceiving? And, and, and they shall follow things taught by demons. Now, I mean, pastors, how do we know? How, how do we know if a particular doctrine is coming from a demon? Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the word of God says certain doctrines will be doctrines taught by demons. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I like to use examples to explain things. I'm just using Christ, for example, on two occasions. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and when he was in the wilderness. Now, Satan himself, the chief demon, brought some strange doctrines. If you bow down and worship me, that's, uh, that's anti-Bible. Um, if you pray to me, if, you, if I command you to do these things and you obey me. And Jesus' response was, it is written. Secondly, in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he was sweating as drops of blood, the sin of the entire world weighed on him. It is not a position that anybody would want to be in. And based on what Christ expressed, if he had the option to go, he would go. But he waited and said, not my will, but thy will be done. And also using Ananias and Sapphira, when you make a pledge before God. So they understood what was right. That's important. They, they, their first motivation was to do what was right. Then self-kicked in. So we have to be aware and we should be cautious against um, selfish motivation. So they had things to gain. And many of the false teachings today, people have a selfish motive. Probably they have to gain treasure. Probably they want to gain power. Probably they, they want to, they, they, they want their, their own, or should I put it, their own end. So some preachers are, are, are talking now, there is nothing called hell. Because we want to live and do what we want and, and suffer no consequences. So most of these false doctrines, I think they work well through selfishness. Um, so I think that even in cases when we are not sure, we should always wait on God and show that he makes it clear to us. And I think that if we do these things, that we, we, we stand a very good chance of not being deceived. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I hear what you're saying, Pastor Gordon, um, you, you're saying to us that any doctrine, any teaching that is contrary to the word of God is actually doctrines of demons. That's right. Yeah. Um, and and, and we, we shall know, we could know, if the spirit is a deceiving spirit, mm -hmm. because if the spirit speaks contrary to the yeah. express will of God, then that's, that's right. a deceiving spirit. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so there we have it. There are many spirits out in the world, um, but we, 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 God has not left us. God has not abandoned us. We want. We have to fend for ourselves as to. I wonder if that is a is a godly spirit. Yes. No, no. Yes. Uh, we don't have to wonder because the word of God is it is it, is a. Is it, I would say the litmus test. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Everything must go up against the word of God. And if any preacher anywhere in the world 
is saying something contrary to the will of God. Um, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's, that's a doctrine of demons. Yeah. You see? Yeah. Some people think you have to go on and enchanted grounds and you have to go with, you know. No, no, no. Doctrine of demons. You could stand up pr- yeah. holding the Bible in your hand, preaching, from the, <laughs> preaching with the yeah. Bible in your hand, but saying something contrary to what the Bible says, giving um, incorrect interpretation. That is doctrines of demons. So we have to be we Pastor, have to be very careful. Pastor Bess, you want to share yeah, something? Um Pastor um Pastor Gordon highlighted something, particularly the encounter Jesus had with with um the devil. And you would notice um that in the word in in, in the encounter, mm-hmm. Satan to an extent quoted certain things from the word of God. He half quoted something. Half, yeah, half yeah. quoted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and so yeah. one needs to be careful. That is why I, I highlighted it to say that um, one really needs to be careful. The Bible tells us, and you shall know the truth, truth and the truth, truth shall set you free. Amen. It also gives us the assurance that the Spirit of God, part of its function is to lead you into all truth. All truth, all truth meaning the entire thing, right? Um, and so when you, when you put those things into perspective, someone um, highlighted also line upon line and and precept upon precept to the law and to the testimony. True. And yeah. so when, 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 when anything that leads against these things, mm-hmm. against the word of God, what, anything that comes and gives you half truth, mm-hmm. it is antichrist. Of course. And you should know. But again, how would you know if it is half truth if you didn't spend time no, familiarizing yourself <laughs> with the entire truth? The entire truth because yeah. one can only know something if he studies it, if he True. familiarizes himself with it. Him or herself with it. So, um, friends of mine, it is important for us to to know the truth, to know the truth as is found in Jesus. And by knowing Him, um, you 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 can be given the assurance that He would lead you in the paths of righteousness. Um, Wonderful. Past, and just one more point, I think especially as human beings, you know, being emotionally charged, we have to be careful with the, with emotions. And uh, just a passage I really like that illustrates that point. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11, um, God's speaking to Elijah. He says, go forth, stand on the mountain. And God was trying to teach Elijah a lesson, how he walks. Um, and there was a strong wind that rent the mountain. Mm-hmm. Plenty action. Yeah, yeah. But the text says, but the Lord was not in the wind. And there was an earthquake shaking up the place, vibration. But the Lord was not in it. Mm-hmm. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. Mm. Passion, burning, scene. Um, dramatic cinematography. But the Lord was not in the fire. But there was a still, small voice. And God spoke to Elijah. And Praise the Lord. You know, in many churches, we look for the hype. We look for the fire. We look for the earthquake. We look for all the things that, you know, get the emotions hyped. But God was trying to remind us that he doesn't always walk in these ways. Right. And sometimes the simple ways, you know, ju- just the ways that are not always emotionally charged. Um, God sometimes brings us back to the foundations if you, if you please right. just the, the basics and sometimes we may have our most powerful encounters with god and i would have known of christians who left the church simply for that mm-hmm. the music or the type of preaching people not talking in tongues and falling down on the ground and all these things and they left for the action church. so just a hey. reminder sometimes god works in the simple stuff okay so you're saying that the holy spirit does not bypass the brain <laughs> you know um some persons think and believe that that drama you know um we do not we're just doing stuff mm-hmm. but the holy spirit does not function like that um we'll take one more question and then we get ready for a special item of music um what are the essential elements pastor best needed in th- needed in these last days to live a successful spirit-led life what are some of the essential elements that we need to to live that successful christian life well in order to um or some of the elements, rather, to live a successful Christian life, I would, I would say um, it is important for one to spend time um, in the Word of God, spend time getting to know Jesus. Um, I would also mention um, it's important for one to develop a regular habit of praying, having that daily devotional connection um, with the Lord, and, and also spreading the Word of God that is being active witness for Jesus. But beyond that, I would also like to mention that it is also important for a person to have that life faith, that life connecting faith in Jesus and being obedient to him. Because, you see, we can read and pray. And then sometimes what we read 
we do we are not obedient to it. Uh, we do we don't believe what we read. So that's where I see our uh, faith and obedience becomes necessary um for us in order for us to have success in our Christian experience. We really need to have that faith and obedience along with the others that I would have mentioned. And I can assure you by the word of God that if we do such things, we can be on our way to experiencing a successful Christian life. Of course, there will be challenges and ups and downs, but our faith and our trust in God would, would help us to not give up, but to keep pressing on and holding on in Jesus. Pastor God, you want to add anything? What, what can uh, trust in having faith in God, Pastor Best says? Any? Right. I'll just reference a couple passages from Ephesians 5, 16 to 21. And the first one, it calls us to be very time conscious. It says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So in other words, by being time sensitive. In other words, if there was a time to play around, that was in the time past. Right now, it's serious time. So we should live knowing that just at the break of day would be the second coming of Christ. And one of the previous questions calls, called us to live circumspectly. So I believe that we should be very time sensitive. We should live according to the time. So when we wake up in the morning, we take our pajamas off, signifying that the night is over. Mm. We get up and we put on our work clothes ready for the day. So right now, we should be in work mode. Um, secondly, it goes on to say, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God. And that wine to me can, be sub can substitute for all the pleasurable things of the world that um, entices our sensibilities, that keeps us in a drunken stupor. But what we should really be investing in and pouring into ourselves things that are spiritual. Um, thirdly, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns. Um, that calls for a continual spiritual atmosphere in our homes, in our hearts. So in other words, we should not divorce when we go to church and how we live our regular life. But we should always be continually dwelling in the presence of God. And the last one, it says, giving thanks always. And we know that we are living in some very serious, challenging times. But when we have that attitude of gratitude, I think we get to see more of what God is doing, what God has done. And we'll be more assured of what God will do for us. So I think these few verses, you know, gives us a nice little cocktail of some of the Amen. elements that we, we should try to possess being ready in such times in which we, we are living in. Yeah, and attitude, I like that one. An attitude of gratitude. Yes. You know, uh, I, 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 I normally say that God hates complaining. Mm. True. No, the children of Israel, you know, God, <laughs> God hates complaining. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. And I think, actually, I think the devil is behind this complaining. The devil wants us to complain. So we're always blaming God for everything that's happening, not yes. seeing the, the beauty of God. So um, we have to be positive um, and, and have a, a, a godly attitude sure. towards the last days as we face the last days with confidence. So far, we, I think we, we're doing very well um, as we look at the topic, facing the last days with confidence. So we are not to be fearful, panicking. The last is upon us, what shall we do? We're facing it with confidence because we're actually facing it with God. You see, we are facing the last days with confidence because we are facing the, um, the last days with God. We, we will pause um, at this time and we'll have a special rendition of music as we, um, our hearts have been made glad by Sister Camilla Sincere. Um, let us go now and listen to Sister Sincere with a wonderful music.
We welcome you back as you are listening to this beautiful rendition from Sister Sincere. Never give up. Jesus is coming soon. Now you say, Pastor, how soon? Well, all I can say is coming soon. Yes, he's coming soon. Thank you so much, Sister Sincere, for this beautiful rendition. Um, and the words are so timely with what we're discussing this morning. Um, facing the last days with confidence. Um, and our confidence is not in man, of course. Our confidence is in God. Thank you so much, um, Sister Sincere. As we continue, as we look at um, our next question here, um, Pastor Bess, can you please explain 1 Corinthians 4 5 as, as it relates to the judgment and last things? 1 Corinthians 4 5 um, says this Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Rather, wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. All right. Um, a wonderful passage of scripture, indeed. Um, that passage of scripture is basically telling, or saying to us, rather, that within God's time, there is an appointed judgment. Right, And at that time, God will do what he has to do in relation to uh, bringing judgment uh, to, to this earth. You know, many persons, you would see them from time to time, or they, they do certain things. A man openly tells a lie, and you tell him, oh, you could just lie, so he would tell you, hey, man, you're judging me. Right? I don't think the text is speaking about that. Right? The text is not speaking about that. The text is basically saying to us, rather, that as Christians, we cannot, um, avoid, we cannot avoid noticing the defects, right, of conduct in our fellow, in our fellow men. But he must, we, we must refrain from judging the motives of, of someone because we, we cannot read the intent of a man's heart. We do not know why a man did something. Or, 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 or. You, you understand where I'm coming from? So as it comes to trying to put a motive to someone's action, um, we are not responsible for that. God, who, as the text clearly said, would bring or judge the motive, in essence. So in, it tells us that God has a time where he would, he would do judgment. And okay. every motive and intent of a man's heart will be clearly a judge fairly because God has all of the facts. Um, from the human po perspective, we... We look at things, we see things, and sometimes we make conclusions without having the facts. But God, who is good, and God who is loving, and God who is fair, he has all the facts. And then at that point, at that appointed time, he is going to uh, pronounce judgment. And his judgment would be true and fair. So it tells us that 
until Jesus Christ comes, let us not um, be going around casting judgment on people when we see they act or do certain things in a certain way, but leave that up to Jesus Christ. Okay, so um, you're saying our role past the best. Um, and Pastor God, I would like you to comment. You, you're saying our role is not to put people in hell or put them in heaven. Correct. Wait and the appointed time. Correct. So, Pastor God, you take the vaccine or not taking vaccine, we are not, our role is not to say who's going where. That, that is not our role. That, that is correct. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, I would also add that there are different, probably could say levels of judgment as well, because there are some matters that God would have committed to us as a church to judge over. For example, you have matters of church discipline. Sometimes as pastors, we have to make a decision on behalf of the church. Probably the behavior of a, of a member warrants a level of judgment. So I would say that God would have given it into the hands of the church temporal judgment. But when it comes to final divine judgment, that belongs to him. And uh, one, one of the reasons for this is God and human beings, we look at different things. In the example of David, when he was selected, all the other sons passed by. And uh, they thought that surely it would have been the older ones that are more mature, that look stronger, more strapling. But it was the smallest of the lot that was chosen. And uh, even in the account to the Pharisee and the publican, the one who was religious, had all the movements, he prayed well, he bent well, he walked well, he looked well, he sounded well. And by human estimate, he would have been the one qualified to be judged as righteous. But the one who couldn't even lift up his head properly to pray, and he just smote his breast um, on Woody, that was the one who left justified. So I think as human beings, you know, we have a natural bias for things that may appeal to the outward, but God sees beyond and beneath and that is why Matthew 7, 1 and 2 encourages us that we should not judge, lest we be judged. So I rightly agree with you, Pastor. We can't put people in heaven or hell. And as we usually say, heaven will have surprises. And last one, the thief on the cross. Whoever thought that a dying thief <laughs> would have had that promise of salvation, you know? So, yeah, very of interesting. Of course, um, I, I, we want to clarify that too as well. Because, um, <clears throat> you know, um, I would probably add a dying repentant thief. Yes. You see, because that that's that makes the difference. That makes the difference. Yes. Correct. Um mm -hmm. because some persons think and feel that okay, um, as Pastor Best said, you don't judge me. Um, you know, I'll get to heaven before you. Well, I'm not sure anybody's getting to heaven before anybody. Mm -hmm. We just know we, we will get there through the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. But um I think in relation in talking to the subject today, facing the, the, the last days with confidence. We have to be mindful. What we're saying, we have to be mindful that we do not, um, um, you know, have final, <laughs> final rights for persons. You know, we, 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 we have a book, so we have final rights. Okay, you, you're going to hell because of that attitude you have. You, you, you're definitely going there, and you're going to heaven. No, we leave that to God because God is a final judge when it comes to, we can indicate, God says, the word of God says, all liars will have their, their part in the lake of fire. Amen. I mean, the word of God says that. So if I want to continue to lie and not repent, I, I should know that's where I'll end up. Yeah. That is different than, than saying to someone, you're going to hell. Because, you know, that is different. We, we, we say what the Bible says. And once we say that, we, 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 should, be, um, we should be in good stead. Um, also, Pass, um, yes. this doesn't mean, um, as you, you made highlights to it, that we are here um, condoning yeah. Any sort of um, reckless living. Uh, of course not. We, of are, course we not. are not condoning it. No. But we are saying that, as Pastor rightfully said, we don't have the prerogative to put one in heaven or in hell. But um, if, you are, if, you, if you know that you're doing something that is not according to Bible standards, you should try to change it, you know? Naturally. Yeah, try to change it. Okay, we move on. How can a Christian be certain that he or she is totally prepared for the events of the last days? How can someone be certain? Because, you know, we, we want to face the last days with confidence, but how can we be certain that we are totally, actually prepared to face the last days? That's the best. <laughs> All right. Well, um, as it pertains to, well, being prepared, God wants us to daily uh, continue to live in that state of, you know, being, getting prepared. Um, but the certainty comes... Um, to me, with daily um, persons, um, would recommit by recommitting your life to the Lord daily. 
you know you you get up in the morning and you recommit your life daily to the lord um you spend time with god in introspection and you surrendering of your will to the will of god you know you 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 daily by daily doing some of the uh, those things rather it helps you to live with a bit of um confidence not in self or not in what you're doing as a person but confidence in the fact that jesus christ is your lord and he what he has done to save you applies to your life as well and by surrendering your will to his will or to his greater plans for your life it helps um develop in you because of the relationship that you would have developed with jesus that assurance that that peace that comes when you know Jesus Christ, He gives you that peace. He said, "That peace I give unto you is not like the world give." And so, when He fills your heart with that peace and that assurance, I I believe you can live with some level of um, confidence or assurance that Jesus will save you when He come. But it, you're not living to say, "I did this" or "I am doing that." It is only because of the grace and merits of Jesus Christ. Okay, Pastor yeah. God, you want to add something to that? Yes, um, I'll just liken it to a, a soldier being assured or certain when going into war. And I will share three A's. The attitude of the soldier, the action and his armor. And I would start with the attitude. I think the, the attitude is one of the most important things because you can have the right action and the right armor, but your mind is not in the right place and you would not, be, you would not have that certainty. And I think that the attitude is expressed by Paul. And it says... Um, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind me, and he continues to press forward. So that attitude of, you know, never getting to this proud place of arrival. So one, the attitude of the Christian should, we should always have a hunger and a desire for growth. And that is a sign that we are well with Christ, that we always want more. Um, we are not there, we are not complete but we still need daily dependence on Christ. And I think secondly, when we look at the, the armor, we have the, the armor of Christ that we should be totally covered with, be, be covered with the, the whole armor of God. Mm -hmm. And it talks about what's on your head, what's on your chest, what's on your feet. So all these, you know, the different dimensions. So I think we should be totally covered. But apart from the armor, we should be covered under the blood. Most importantly, um, washed, justified, protected. And, of course, the right action. And that when it comes to implicit obedience, you know, on, on Christ. So I would say the right attitude, we want more. The right armor, we covered. But also the right action, doing what is right. Okay, yeah. I like that. Um, implicit, that word. Complete. Trust. So we, we, should not be, we should not be facing the last days panicking. No, sir. You know, if we'll make it. One, no, is, is it the devil to have us wondering, hmm. you know, I wonder if I'll make it. I, I wonder if I'm good enough. Well, we, none of us are good enough. The blood of Jesus Christ is good enough. Sure. And, and it's powerful enough mm -hmm. to cover us, um, each one of us. Yeah. So we can indeed face the last days with the confidence knowing that Jesus won it at the cross. Yeah. That's important. Um, as we come down, how... How are we to live our lives in light of the, the judgment of the last things? Um, please comment on Ephesians 5.16. How are we to live our lives, Pastor God, in, as it relates to the judgment and last things? How are we to live our lives? Um, as you make a comment on Ephesians 5.15. All right, you want to read the passage for us, Pastor? Oh, sure. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, Be careful. Mm -hmm. Be very, you read it from the NIV, that is. Be very careful, then, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. And I read verse 16 to making the most of every opportunity nice. because the days are evil. Amen. Be careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but wise. How, how, we, how do we live as wise? Yeah. You know, I love the old school King James word to live circumspect. And just the sounding of the word. <laughs> okay. Okay. You, know, you could read it. <laughs> yes. I'm um, saying, um, <laughs> see then. That you walk circumspectly, That's right. not as fools, but as wise, yes. redeeming the time, mm -hmm. because the days are evil. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you want to tell us about that word, that yes, old English man. word, circumspect. That's right, man. Mm -hmm. um, you know, w one version amplifies it by saying it means to live with honor, to live with purpose, to live with courage, um, to live as those who are responsible. And I think that that word, circumspect, you know, it, it can have two applications, personal 
but also for the public. And when you think of royalty, when you, when you look at the royal family, how they carry themselves, they dress a certain way, they are schooled to walk a particular way, their language, their mannerism, because they reflect the royal family, the royal order. But also, personally, there should be a life that they are convicted by. And I would say, to live circumspect, we, we, we need to live with the weight of the responsibility that we have as Christians to be the beacons to the world. But that light, of course, should first penetrate our hearts. So we have to be convicted. We have to experience salvation, but also live it. So every step we take should be calculated. Um, if I do this, how am I going to affect my brother or my sister? Um, if I take that course of action, how will it affect me or my family? So it's a, I wouldn't say that you, you are living in a bubble, you know, but you are living in a conscious way at all times that I am special. And my influence is one that is long-lasting. And anything I do can derail or encourage my work with God. So it's a life of extreme caution. Mm -hmm. you, you said, Pastor, you, you don't want to say that you live in a bubble. But I would say, yeah, you're living in a Jesus bubble. All right. You see, you, you actually live. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. uh, Pastor Bess, um, should we, as we move on, our time is running away. Should we stockpile food supplies um, as we anticipate, as, you know, uh, the, 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 the final days? Uh, as, as a means of preparation for the final days, should we stockpile food supplies? <laughs> that's that's. And if we should, <laughs> what kind of food we should stockpile? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a very, very, very um interesting question. You know, as we go forward, um, the Bible reminds us that in Matthew chapter six and verse thirty-three that we should seek first uh, the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Um, should we stockpile food? I well, I would say um, we should prepare ourselves for what is to come, right? Um, preparation takes up many different approach. Um, to me, when it comes to the impending conflict or challenges, food would not really cut it, meaning um, the issue of food, it, it, we have to eat, yes, but imagine something is about to happen, circumstances change, and uh, you have to just leave everything and run, so all the food you would have stockpiled, you still have to leave it behind. To me, what, what, is, what should be stockpile is our spiritual maturity and growth, our, our spiritual connection with Jesus Christ. And so more than food, you see, because the conflict is more than food, and the Bible gives us the assurance that even in those times, God is going to prepare for us. Our bread and water will be sure, mm -hmm. right? And so um, more than food is our relationship with God when these times come to be able to stand because we can have all the food in the world. We can stockpile all the food. But if we don't stockpile a proper relationship with Jesus, when that time of conflict comes, um, we, would, we, we, we would find ourselves wanting. And I prefer um, being in a position where I'm good with God and wanting food, if you understand me, okay. than have enough food and wanting a good relationship with Christ. Wonderful. Yeah. Pastor God, you want to add something to that? Yes, I, I agree with Pastor Bess. I think our preparation should be reasonable. I don't think we should be on the extreme side of stockpiling 100 cans of sardine or 200 cans of big beans or buy all the water from Glen Elgin and just have it sitting there. But I believe for the impending conflict, there will be a time when we'll survive on what we have prepared. But there comes a time when no human effort, no human action can sustain us, but only by the will of God. And I like the story of Joseph. When they prepared for the famine, they stockpiled food. And for that time, the food was used to supply the needs of Egypt and that of the children of Israel as well. So I believe there is a place for that where God will use others um, who have in abundance um, probably lands and food that will sustain God's people. But there, there comes a time when we have to leave it and run. It will be destroyed. It will be burnt. And only then, just like in the wilderness, God will provide every step of the way. Yes, yeah, so man shall not live by bread alone, for but by himself. every word that proceeds out of the mud of God. We're getting ready to come down. We have a promotional video, a teleton. Um, the, the theology department of the University of the Southern Caribbean is on a fundraising drive to raise some funds um, for needy students. And um, so we just want to share. Um, that's on Sunday the, the 5th. So we want to share that video with you. And so that you could contribute, you can contact us here. Uh, at the mission live by some whatever means so we can we can let you know how you can contribute so at this time we'll have the promotional video we'll come back for the last um question and the remaining two minutes of the program oh. 
From Egypt to Canaan, the journey home. That's the theme of a one-day preachathon and a sunset concert by the University of Southern Caribbean School of Theology and Religion. Join us on December 5th and hear spirit-filled messages from top regional and international speakers. The Sunset Concert will feature inspiring music and drama with the best talent from the region, including the University Choir. You can't afford to miss From Egypt to Canaan, The Journey Home on December 5th and to help us raise funds for the theology students. We're back for our final moments here. Um, as I said, if you would like to contribute to the, the needy students at USC, that's the students from the theology department, you can um, do so. You can get more information on that. Money can be paid online, or you can contact the conference, and we can make the payments for you once you um, pass the money. The final question, should the Christians, Pastor Gordon, be concerned with the new world order? What, what's that? Should the Christians be concerned about this, this term? You ever heard about this, this, the new world order? Yes. Um, simply put, I would say that the, the new world order simply represents the many continual attempts of mankind to really run the world under one central system. I believe that we should be mindful, we should be knowledgeable, we should be aware, but we should not be too concerned to the point when we are stressed out. Um, I believe that God took time, even through prophetic writings, um, even in the book of Daniel, um, the mingling of the iron with clay, man trying to come together. So it was written for a reason, so that we should be mindful, we should be prepared. Um, so I, I should say we should be concerned but not stressed out because this is a message we have to preach as well it affects us and it affects the world but in that same vision we see that a hand um, or the stone cut off without hands destroy that image so at the end of the day once our trust is in christ and we have that assurance that we we need then we don't have to be worried we don't have to be worried okay pastor you want to comment I yeah see. i just want to say um like pastor you should be you should know about it but you shouldn't be consumed by it to the point where you become a fanatic. Because there are many persons who uh, they make themselves consumed by, by certain things. And all you hear they talking about is this and is new all other, new all other. But we, um, amidst all of that, we should still always be mindful that God has a plan for our lives. And he has a mission that we need to focus on spreading according to Revelation chapter 14. And so um, as a Christian, as the people of God, while we know about it, but our focus should be that of spreading the everlasting gospel and preparing the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Wonderful. Thank you so much, pastors. In fact, let me just say that when, we, when, when um, persons refer to the New World Order, they're really referring to that conspiracy theory where the elitist group um, somewhere in the world uh, are on this, this tra trajectory to, to depopulate the world just to have a certain, you know, a, a couple billion, and they would, they would run things on the one world government. Um, I would say I believe in a new world order, not, not as they say, but as Daniel, as Pastor Gordon was saying, a new world order where Jesus, Jesus will be in charge. Amen. That's the new world order I'm talking about, not the conspiracy theory. So we have to be so consumed and worried that this is going to happen and, 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 and this is what they're doing. Um, but let us keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus because the stone which will be cut out without hands will be that, that Jesus himself as he sought to set up his kingdom. Um, we thank you so much, all of our viewers and listeners um, out there. We thank you for your comments. We thank you for um, just being there and listening to us because we know once you're there, we know that you're hearing us and our message are going forward. So we thank you so much. We look forward to, um, to, to see you hopefully um, next week, God's will. But of course, we have a rebroadcast tonight at, at 8 um, or thereabout. We, um, so keep spreading the message. Liking, sharing the, the page, and let others know that Pastor's Corner is getting bigger and bigger in Jesus. God bless you, and have a wonderful day. Pastor Best, could you close with prayer for us? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we, we are so grateful for the presence of your Holy Spirit as we would have conducted this healthy um, discussion here. And um, I pray that persons may get the mindset or that they can go through these final times in earth's history with the confidence that you are there and that you would save them. So there God be with myself, Pastor um, Enoch, Pastor Gordon. I pray that you would bless us. Bless everyone viewing online. And may we continue to rest our hope in Jesus. So that when he comes, we can all meet him in the air. 
For this is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Until next week, God bless. The intriguing series on the seven trumpets of Revelation continues. Join us on Mission Life Grenada via YouTube and Facebook at 7 p.m. on Sunday, 5th December. Be spiritually enriched by this very important message captioned, The Little Book. It will be presented by Pastor Bernard Lyons. Join us and be blessed.